Hi everyone, wonderful to be here. Um, thank you so much to the BFC for having us. Uh, my name is Rachel. I'm the uh, Sustainable Fashion Advocacy Lead at the UN Environment Programme. Um, I'm really pleased to be playing the role of host today um, on what I think we will all consider a really, really important topic right now about regulation readiness, um, given just how much is coming down the line uh, for all of us that we do indeed need to be prepared for. I think what's really interesting about this is having done a lot with the BFC at these forums for many years, it's very interesting to see the evolution of these discussions. You know, these panels used to be about the need for policy, um, about the fact that we needed to get it in front of people, that we as an industry needed to unite behind it, the fact that we needed it to support all of the work and so forth. And of course now we're really digging in much more deeply into how to proactively actually be ready for it. And that's a huge and really, really important shift. Now, we all know there's a huge uh, volume of activity coming from the EU particularly that will impact the fashion sector from the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive to the Eco Design for Sustainability uh, for Sustainable Products Regulation, the Green Claims Directive and beyond. But the whole scene is heating up with action, of course, in lots of other places around the world as well, um, not least what's happening in France. I'm sure many of you have been following along there. And of course, um, lots of heating up in the US also. Um, so a lot that I think really has the potential to change the playing field. It's definitely time. But our question today is how do we prepare and where do we focus? Unfortunately, I'm joined by some incredible experts to discuss just that. So I may just ask each of you to please introduce yourselves to start. Maybe we can begin with you, other Rachel. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rachel Franklin and I am the sustainability lead at River Island. Uh, I'm Cecilia Parker Arana. I'm a director of consumer protection at the Competition and Markets Authority, um, and I've been working with our Green Claims Code uh, on greenwashing. Hi, I'm Pauline. I work at Trust Trace, uh, a traceability platform where I monitor, uh, well, try to monitor all the policies, laws, and regulations that are addressing our industry, uh, feeding that into the product so we can be sure to be ready for compliance. Hi, I'm Olivia Fulton. Um, I'm from the law firm Mish Conduea. Um, I've been guiding kind of retail clients through all of the new legislation that's coming. Amazing. So really good cross-section of different um, job roles, functions and expertise here with us today. So Rachel, I wanted to start with you. As I mentioned in my introduction, there is a huge volume of activity in the policy space um, for textiles now heating up, um, which is so important, as we've said, but it also makes for an enormous challenge for businesses in terms of getting everything aligned to be compliant um, or indeed ahead of compliancy. Where are you as River Island focused in terms of that preparation and which specific pieces of policy are you therefore looking at the most? Yep. So we started about three years ago um, to, we took the decision to purchase a platform that could help us trace our supply chain, specifically at um, order line level so that we could start to get an understanding of who our suppliers were and who their suppliers were and who their processes were and their componentry and everything like that so that we could start to get that information. Um, with that information now, what we're doing is specifically focusing on the digital product passport. And the reason that we've taken that view has been quite holistic in that we decided to look at what information do we think we need to declare, what information do we know at the moment based on what we're having to declare for like other legislation, as you mentioned in France? And then we also thought, you know, where are the gaps? Where is the gaps in the information that we potentially might have to provide? So although the um, ESPR, which is the Eco um, Design for Sustainable Products Regulation, <laughs> sorry, we're having to learn a whole new language. Um, <laughs> Although that hasn't actually defined all the different um, data streams that we're going to need to include, we just took that view that we needed to define that and that's the best way for us to be able to communicate to our customers and to the regulation bodies about all, all the different parts that we think we're going to need to declare. So we've been working for a year now identifying all of those different data sources and like probably most retailers out there, We've got lots of different systems and they don't like talking to each other. So it's been a real work to try and speak to our IT teams as well and understand how we can get all of those different um, systems to link together so that we can then project, pull that information together as a digital product passport so that we're ready when we do need to declare this. 
And what within all of that, you know, there's the infrastructure part, as you said, but what within it are you finding to be the most challenging aspect? Um, <laughs> IT. <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to book time in with our IT team. I think we got given a 12-month lead time. Oh. So, <laughs> yeah, works well. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of, you know, the world is going so much more digitalised at the moment and there's a lot of stress on the IT teams. You know, we've got a lot of work that we're doing at the moment on our online platform. So they're, they're, there's got a lot of huge amount of work that's currently going on. So it sounds ridiculous to say that we needed to give them 12 months notice, but we did because they needed to know exactly what we were asking of them, how long that would actually take. And then they also had other work to fit in along the, uh, at the same time because we're talking to architects who are having to build ways in which systems can link. That's fascinating. And I want to come back to those timelines because I think that is a really important aspect of today's conversation in terms of when we need to be ready for things. But Pauline, to throw the same question over to you, with, with those that you work with, with TrustTrace, what has been your experience in terms of how challenging it is to be prepared for what is coming? And what are the challenges that you're identifying particularly? Yeah, there is a lot of challenges. Obviously, the native challenge of being in this industry where it's just ever-changing and very complex uh, supplier networks, right? But then this challenge of the number of regulations that have been addressing our industry in the last couple of years has been a challenge because it's difficult to know what should you prioritize, what's more important right now. Should you go you know, with a specific market where you're importing your goods or is forced labor more important than deforestation right now? Like there's no such way to do, to do that kind of prioritization. So that's really challenging. So you have to analyze all of them. But then... The good part here is that when you start analyzing them, they do have some, there's some lap over and there are some things in common in many of the regulations. So when you sort of realize that and made your prioritization, the challenge becomes what you were mentioning. Okay, but do we have our data in order? Do we have, you know, the IT maturity, uh, our PLM systems uh, in place, ERP systems, so all, you can fetch all that data and connect it into traceability um, solution providers such as us or any other one. So that's the challenge. And then you need, you know, this alignment with the C-suite and the board to make sure that this is not just a one, one project that runs uh, with one department. It's actually a huge program that needs to be fi fin financed properly and run long scale, long term. So there are several challenges uh, on that. And then I think with, with some of the regulations as well, especially maybe looking at the due diligence regulations that are here, it's not just finding that data and, you know, providing a due diligence statement or a whatever code of conduct that we sort of made it, did a few years ago. Now you actually need to substantiate your claims, you need to make <coughs> business change, you need to monitor, mitigate, prevent, take these actions. And that, again, you need to roll up your sleeves. So it's, it's a full... It's a machine that you need to get going, uh, so it's a lot of work. But there are tools there to, to help you. To, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And because you said substantiating claims, I'm going to come to Cecilia. <laughs> very nice segue. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, you are, of course, focused on green claims specifically. Can you just talk a little bit more about that work, how it has evolved, um, but also what you have recently been able to get some key fashion businesses to commit to in this space? Yes, I mean, this work started... Um, actually more than four years ago, it was sort of initial inception, but in 2021 we published the Green Claims Code and it has six principles for business to follow to make sure that their environmental claims um, comply with consumer protection law. Um, from there we um, worked on a, a, what we call a compliance review of the fashion sector, so we spent a lot of time um, browsing fashion websites, looking at what people were doing, how they were communicating, um, and identified a sort of a raft of issues that we thought were um, likely to be confusing or misleading customers and from there then we opened investigations. Um, those investigations included recently and we, we looked at um, ASOS, Boohoo and also the George Asda fashion range and they've all given us voluntary commitments to make changes um, which cover um, a host of different issues but things like um, uh, website design um, in terms of filters and how you're describing filters and, and helping consumers navigate their way to um, specific material types or specific um, uh, aspects of sustainability, um, labelling and what information customers need on a label and when sometimes it might not be possible to, to make a claim because you just can't give the, the complete picture on a label. 
Um, and then there's also some stuff in there about the, the processes that businesses need to be thinking about in terms of um, supply chain certification, due diligence, um, to, to try and uh, minimise the risk that a, a claim is made that is, is uh, going to mislead customers. And when we move into the second part of this session today, we're going to be looking at the Green Claims Directive from the EU specifically as one of the examples that's going to be discussed can you just talk a little bit, you know, as you've said, those commitments are voluntary. How does that then tie into the Green Claims Directive in the EU, which many of the businesses in this room will, will, will need to look at, um, respond to? Um, and it's obviously coming pretty fast. How, how does it connect in? And, and, and if so, what are those connections looking like? So, yes, it doesn't, it doesn't connect indirectly. Um, in, in the UK currently, we have the Consumer Protection Regulations, which are based on the European Unfair Commercial Practices Directive. Um, we now have amendments coming to the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, um, which will um, uh, uh, they're designed to, to, to tackle green claims specifically. At the moment, it's a, a very principles-based regulation which covers any kind of misleading conduct by business. So that's going to provide more specific guidance to businesses. Um, at the moment, there aren't plans in the UK to follow them down that route, although the CMA has made certain recommendations to government that they, they need to um, look at some of these more specific factors and, and bring them into the, to the guidance. But I think in some ways it's a, a, it's a little bit of a red herring from a consumer protection point of view. I'm not saying that it won't make a difference to how businesses operate, but many of the things that are being specified in the new European legislation are things which we would say are already problematic in terms of the consumer protection regulation. So if I take something like um, using words like sustainable or eco-friendly, um, they're, they're, it's going to be much harder or, or impossible to use those in, in, uh, under the new European legislation. But actually in the UK, it's already really difficult to use those because unless you can demonstrate that from, from cradle to grave or cradle to cradle, you're not having an environmental impact with your with your garment, we would say that um, those terms are too broad and are, are mm. going to mislead consumers. So I think in practice, um, compliance with the, with the new European rules um, is probably likely to, to remain compliant with the, the UK rules. Yeah, that, that's good to know. And I think a lot of this is indeed about that um, sort of cohesiveness, isn't it, when there are so many points coming, which, which again we'll come to in, in a moment. But Olivia, I just wanted to, to bring, in, bring, bring you in. With the work that you're doing at, at Mishcon to help the industry prepare for all of this, where are you seeing the biggest focus? I mean, already just to see from the three speakers here, we've, we've talked about three different areas, obviously interconnected, but where are you seeing a lot of focus or where would you recommend the focus to be even? Um. So we're actually seeing at this stage, a lot of our clients are really interested in the education piece, the workshops, the training, just to try and get their head around what is this legislation that's coming through. So you know, definitely while some of the clients we work with, particularly in the luxury sector, are really developed in their kind of journey towards compliance, there's a lot of businesses that, um, you know, they're still in that risk profiling stage. They want to know where the biggest risks sit in their business. Um, what they need to prioritize, what steps they need to take. So there's kind of that piece. And then it goes back to what's already been discussed, but it's the supply chain piece. Um, so we've been working a lot with developing due diligence criteria um, for onboarding new suppliers, looking at how you then manage and collaborate close, closer with manufacturers and suppliers um, in the supply chain and also mitigating that risk of unapproved subcontracting, which is obviously so endemic in the fashion industry and what makes it so difficult to properly map supply chains. Yeah, that's super interesting and so many pieces in that. But I'm interested, you know, if, you're, if the industry at large is at the stage of education, which I, I believe we can all definitely agree with in terms of getting our heads around it and understanding it, I'd like to just touch on timelines, as we mentioned with Rachel, but Olivia, just to stick with you for a moment, the panel description for today said about, uh, it referred specifically to the changing regulation landscape in the next two years. When, from your perspective, do we need to be ready for most of this? Do you have a view on what that timeline looks like? Um, it's a good question. So some of the regulation has already come into force. Uh, so for example, the deforestation regulation, if that applies to you, you'd have to submit your due diligence statement by the end of this year or June 2025 if you're a micro enterprise. 
There has also been some really significant developments um, on some of the key legislation we spoke about the forum last year in the last few months. So there's now an informal agreement on the wording of the Eco Design for Sustainable Products Regulation, the Packaging and the Packaging Waste Regulation. Um, and what this means in practice is that although it's not been formally adopted yet, um, essentially, it's, it's expected that the wording isn't going to change. So we're starting to get some clarity on what those new rules will look like. Um, there's also, it's important to note, there's the European elections coming up in June. So probably the next couple of months, we won't expect any further updates until, until that's happened. Um, so whilst I can't kind of give a real clear drop dead date on you have to have your digital product passport by X at this stage, I would just echo what Rachel said is, you know, the 12 months to get a meeting with your IT department. Um, the road to compliance is a long one. Um, mapping your supply chain, selecting what tech partner you're going to work with, piloting what you, you want your digital product passport to look like. That's, you know, a couple of years journey. So really kind of you need to start now. <laughs> <laughs> So, Rachel, bearing in mind that you've got 12 months wait list for your IT team. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to kill me, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> what timeline are you realistically working towards with the pieces that you're doing if you were to take the DPP as an example? Yeah, we're using the principle at the moment, which obviously it's a movable fees that um, the um, ESPR guidance theoretically should come out in the summer uh, and they give you about 18 months. So at the moment we're working to um, January 26 as an aim to have it um, for product um, and we should be there or thereabouts with enough time remembering our lead times for products <laughs> and how we need to get it into products. <laughs> and IT. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think the industry as a whole is taking these timelines seriously? I mean that does sound very soon. Yeah it, it is really soon and I think you know you've got to bear in mind that you know a lot of the product that we make we're, we're, is like nine months lead time so you know, we've got to be mindful of those lead times to be able to get this on the product before um, it comes into store. Um, and no, I don't think everyone's taking it seriously. I think even, you know, every brand I've spoken to, I think everyone's just waiting for the legislation. But, you know, as we've said, it takes a really long time to develop a lot of these things and, to, and get them working. And just to even like, you know, we're on a three year journey so far just to understand our supply chain. So, you know, you've got to have that information for, to comply with all of this legislation. So it is, you have to start working on this now. I really can't stress that enough. It, it's, there's been so many things that have popped up just in the short time we've been looking at it that we've had to work on. And it is something that's coming thick and fast and you need to prepare. And I suppose one of the challenges with all of it is that it's obviously not just preparing in one place, as, as yeah. we've already mentioned briefly. Pauline, I wanted to come to you just to have that broad perspective again. You know, obviously we're, we're today talking, and, and indeed when we go into the workshop section, we'll be talking about two of the EU pieces specifically. But as I mentioned at the beginning, of course, there is tons of movement happening elsewhere as well. Do you feel that that's helpful in terms of preparation or is it causing more headaches and challenges? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it further enhances the urgency and yeah, it does bring a headache and some confusion because there is similar regulations in all the countries and in the EU we have, you know, sometimes a directive and all regulation and directive means that each of the 27 member states needs to transpose that into a national law, so 27 versions of that and then you have the non-EU members uh, or in the, and, and the US, so yes, uh, it, is, it is confusing but also, there are a lot of things that you can, you know, if you start mapping your supply chain, if you start gathering data, granular data, and going deeper and learning more about, you know, how to de-risk your supply chain, that you, because you have to do that if you're a global company, then you can reuse much of that data for any regulation. And of course, there will be different asks if it's deforestation or if it's forced labor or what, what not, but you need to start you know, gathering at a granular, le granular level and reuse that. So, yeah, it's a bit of a headache, but you, you will not do it in vain, so. And I suppose one thing just to emphasize, because you, you just mentioned a couple of examples there, is we're not talking just about environmental, but social data here as well, right? Yeah. It's across both sides in as much depth. Yeah, and it's very different. I mean, there's, 
I think a few years ago we saw a lot of the environmental regulations being out there and we, we talked a lot about them, but now it's very much on due diligence, social aspects, like how do you de-risk your supply chain in that sense, a lot of topics on forced labor, and we see maybe some countries are being inspired by the others in terms of UFLPA in the US, the forced labor regulation there, that was revolutionary in many ways, and, and the ask for brands, right, it was, it's difficult to comply with it, um, but then we see similar thing happening now in the EU with the EU ban on forced labor that is also asking for a very granular data collection. And it went through fast track. And we haven't really seen a regulation being passed that fast as, as that did. And it's, I mean, I wouldn't say it's inspired by, but it's, there are some similarities. And yeah. Super helpful. You'll have to all bear with me a little bit, I get. If anybody else gets migraines, I've just got one and I've lost my vision down here, so I'm going to have to just lift my iPad up, <laughs> which is, I think, the lights. But anyway, um, now it's disappeared, so apologies, one second. Um, Cecilia, just to you, you mentioned before, and certainly when we spoke in our briefing call, about providing recommendations to the UK government that you've, that you've previously given. One example was around supply chain transparency. Can you just share a little bit more about this and also what, what comes of... of an entity like yours giving recommendations to government? Um, well, the, the second part's a harder question to answer. <laughs> um, but yeah, w one of the things when we started doing this piece of work, um, we did a, a general call for, for information and um, uh, the businesses that replied, one of the key things that they highlighted was the challenges in getting information from their suppliers. Um, and I guess there were two issues with that. One is that uh, in some industries you have very, very long supply chains and the, the data doesn't naturally... Um, or does, doesn't easily flow through. Um, but then there are also issues um, around business structure and um, um, multi-brand retailers who might not only be a customer of a, another business, but also um, a competitor. Uh, and in those circumstances, there's a reluctant to, uh, a reluctance to pass the, the information through the, the supply chain. And I think that's where some of the um, interesting work that's going on with supply chain tracking can be, because that can be used to uh, facilitate... Um, uh, I suppose, enough information going through to be confident about basing your claims on it without necessarily disclosing commercially sensitive information. So um, back in, again, I think this was back in 2021, the then um, Secretary of State for Business, I've lost track of how many we've had since then, <laughs> um, asked the CMA for some advice on both competition and on consumer protection um, and the role that um, those frameworks could play in supporting the transition to a, a low carbon economy and focus on, on sustainability. Um, and part of our response in that, we recommended various things. So we, we suggested the government needed to look at uh, right to repair. We suggested more work needed to be done around overconsumption. Um, there were some specific suggestions about modifying the consumer protection framework. Um, and a suggestion that um, more needed to be done to require disclosure of environmental impact information um, for all products and not just for those that wanted to talk about sustainability, um, but also to enhance supply chain um, transparency to make sure that, that um, there's a, a legal requirement for that information to flow, to flow through. Um, now, we're now two years on from the CMA publishing its advice and we haven't had a response um, from government as far as I've, I can tell. Um, but we do have legislation going through at the moment um, on uh, the Digital Markets Competition and Consumer Bill, which um, one of the things it's doing is um, taking a, a sort of a power for government to um, create more banned practices. So those are practices that are um, considered unfair in all circumstances. And one of the things that we're, we're, um, uh, we've recommended is that green, uh, un misleading green claims or unsubstantiated green claims be added to to that list. So I think we're probably probably a ways away from, from having that kind of supply chain transparency law, but it is something that, that we know from businesses they need to, um, to help them get that information to consumers. No, that's super interesting and also good to hear on the green claim side of things. Again, on that note then, given that we're talking about readiness and obviously we've heard from others that you know, preparing for these things in one place will hopefully help in lots of other places, what would be your advice for people to comply with the Green Claims Code, other than obviously following the, the six key points that are in there, but, but advice for people sort of more holistically in terms of how to, to be prepared for that. Yeah, well, so I mean, I, th I think there's, there's two things I would do. One is to separate the, the substance of what you're doing in sustainability from what you're communicate, communicating to consumers, because um, 
it's not always necessary to um, to make the claims, even if you're doing the right thing and, and thinking very carefully about that. The thing I say most to businesses is uh, is to put yourself in the shoe of the shoes of the consumers. Um, it's amazing how often I see. Um, claims that clearly somebody's thought this is a, a great way for us to sell product and they've never imagined themselves in the other on the other side of the advert and thought about if I saw this what would I think mm. um, now obviously not every business can go out and and uh, and you know do detailed consumer research and some some can some can't but most of them have a way of, of reaching out to their customers and at least saying if if you saw this would you understand what I was I was doing so I think that's that's the big thing and then We've tried with the uh, with the undertakings that we've we've um, accepted recently from ASOS, Boohoo, and ASDA. We listened very carefully to um, what they were telling us about how supply chains worked, what certification was available, how quickly information flows through with the certification schemes, um, and so we've we've tried to approach that in quite a practical way, um, and and really asking businesses to think about how you can give yourself as a business the confidence that what you're telling your customers is correct, even if you don't have all of the kind of the rubber stamp certificates for every garment at, at that point. Um, so so I guess the big advice is go away and read read the undertakings that we've accepted. We, we will be um, publishing some further guidance that kind of puts them into slightly plainer English. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, th there's a lot in there that, that will help businesses think about how you approach um, giving those messages. Yeah, that's great. And I presume, Olivia, that plainer English piece is a part of the role that you guys play in terms of helping people to understand it. One of the questions I wanted to ask you was just around, you know, we've heard there about understanding it from the consumer's perspective. Who are you finding or who do you think need to be the stakeholders that are engaged on this, given that we've got quite a lot of probably quite a lot of different job roles in the room? You know, who, who should be the ones that are speaking to you? Who should be the ones really thinking about preparing for it other than obviously somebody that's in a Rachel role here? Um, so thinking about the key stakeholders in your business, um, definitely first and foremost, the senior leadership team need to be engaged, that C-suite, um, because there will be financial investment required to be able to comply, resources allocated to compliance, and so that's absolutely critical. Then also it will depend on the specific legislation. So if you're looking at the Green Claims Directive, obviously, you know, the CMO, your marketing team being abreast of what the changes mean um, is really critical. If you're looking at the Eco Design for Sustainable Products Regulation, then, you know, your design team, procurement buyers are going to need to be upskilled and trained um, and, and buy into that, the compliance program there. But I would say also that, you know, the legislation is so far-reaching, it touches every cycle of the product, a stage of the product cycle, um, that really kind of anyone that touches the product within your business is going to be a key stakeholder. Um, and so rather than kind of ESG being a separate team or siloed function, I think really to comply, it's going to have to be integrated into every stage of a decision that's made about a product. Um, so then, back to the key, hold, key stakeholders point, is there's going to have to be policies and, and training rolled out to the, the whole organisation. Yeah, any like builds? And, and, and also I'd love to know how that plays out in practice. Yeah, I think I, I, I totally agree with all of that. I, I just add that I think it's really key to engage your supply chain. Like, um, it's really important that they understand the legislation that's coming as well. And the reason that we're asking for this information isn't to delve into the hidden workings of their business and catch them out. It's because we have, we're being asked for it as well. And it's really to sort of get them on board and through the work that we've done so far in trying to trace our supply chain, that's been key, having constant and continued um, communication with the suppliers themselves to just explain the process, what we require, why we require it and allow them to have um, ask as many questions as possible along the way as well, because they're on the journey with us. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. And, and I think that's a really interesting note to, to, to lead into our final question around different stakeholder groups. The focus, as we heard this morning for the forum today, is around different actions that um, businesses, citizens and the UK government can take, um, and obviously in this case, can take when it comes to preparing for regulation that's coming. I'd love to hear from each of you about an action that any one of those stakeholder groups should take in your, um, in, in your opinion. 
much. <laughs> I start. We'll, we'll go along um, the line. Yeah. Um, I think from a government point of view, I'd like to see um, a look as much alignment as possible. I think we're going to get into a dangerous realm of um, overwhelming businesses with um, reporting and data collection. And I think as much as there might be pros and cons to some of the European legislation, I think we've got to bear in mind that, you know, we're going to have to collect that data anyway. So whatever we decide for the UK, it would be good to have as much alignment as possible with what we're having to provide regularly to all these different organisations and countries. Amazing. Thank you. Cecilia? Um, well, I mean, coming from the perspective of government, I guess for, for businesses, um, look, at the, look at the guidance and, and work things through. Think about what, what your customers need from you. Um, I would also add that the, um, the CMA has recently published a, a different set of guidance on sustainability agreements, which is really designed to give businesses the conf uh, confidence to collaborate um, and, and not to worry um, too much about competition law if, if there are innovations that can be made by working together to address some of the supply chain issues, for example. So um, I think engaging with, with the CMA, if you have got an idea for collaborating with, with some of your competitors, engaging with us to uh, um, work on some of those issues, we can give you advice up front to, to keep you right. I'm going to just suggest to the BFC team that we have a session on competition law next year, please. <laughs> I think that's really relevant and very necessary. Uh, Pauline, from you. Yeah, so you sort of took mine my ask to policymakers to please align like between the nations and globally so i'm going to go with two brands like timing this i know some of them are a few years away 27 28 a lot will happen but it's very soon guys it's we have to start working now and then some things i've heard throughout the day it's been that you know there are public consultations on these regulations and um you are welcome to feedback on these regulations and i think also uh, paul dillinger's shared in the, in the session this morning that, you know, we're, please don't lobby against it. Like, we're, I think we're all here for a reason. We're all in the same sort of, you know, group here. We, we believe this is necessary, but also help in this journey. So, yeah, f give feedback to the, to the policies at early stage and don't lobby against it. Amazing. Thank you. And Olivia? Um, I think we have one for the government just to provide... Uh, uh, sufficient support and financial support, training, guidance to SMEs that make up so much of the industry. Super, thank you. Well, I'm going to pass back to Emily from Deloitte and we are going to then set the room up for the next part of this session. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>